We are clear, according to Derek Brandale, for the Real Kipper and Bourne show. I'm Nick Kiprios. He's Justin Bourne. He's Sammy McKee, along with Jen Rolnick. We'll be with you with the next two hours on Sportsnet 590, Sportsnet 360, and Sportsnet Plus. You can always get our podcast wherever you get your pods. If you can't catch us live, and give us a text at 590-590. We'll see if Sammy can get your thoughts and ideas out at mm-hmm. some point in the next two hours. Just before we went and, and kicked off the show, uh, you mentioned Josh Hosang. Yeah. What is going on with Josh Hosang? He's got a hip hop album out. No way. Yes. Dude, he scored like, I want he had 35 points in 45 games for the Marlies in 2022. And so I checked his elite prospects today, see what he's up to or whatever. And after seeing a tweet, they had a hip hop album out. There's no, no hockey. So, so you, like, I think he's just doing the hip hop thing. And I got to tell you, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty Are you good. a hip hop guy? I am, yeah. You I've, are. Since, yeah, my whole life, that's kind of been my. Okay. That and, you know, like emo depressing stuff. But was, mostly it, was it that long ago that we thought he'd be a, a, not just a good player, but maybe a a great player in the island? Super talented. To a guy that needed some time to readjust, get himself with the Toronto Maple Leaf organization, mm-hmm. and a guy that we legitimately thought could come in and win a spot for the Leafs to... Hip hop. Hip hop. He's uh, 28 <laughs> now. He's 28. And Buddy, he didn't just, play last that's, year. That's prime years yeah. for a hockey player. That's prime year for rapping, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's strength of the iron's hot here. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, two years ago, we had a show together then, and he had a really good training camp for the Leafs. I remember that. And at one point, he actually scored some goals. He had like a run of good play. Yeah. And I remember having the discussion should Hosang get some run with the Leafs? And yeah, now he's got a track called Poppy for MVP. Wow. Yeah, he's got... Uh, <laughs> you know, Kipper, like, was that before the last eight games? That might Kipper have been 2022 like as well. No, 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 I'm fine with it. <laughs> but there, If he can win it, it would help a lot. One of them was Hobby to a Passion. Like, I think he's turned the page on... The album's called Same. It's on Spotify. Wow, I'm definitely checking that out on the subway right, right home. You, I've, honestly, I Honestly, think you'll like it. Okay, I'm looking <laughs> Which, forward to it. I was, I was ready for the awkward, like, oh, this is going to hurt to listen to. I was like, huh. all right. Okay. Anyway. All right. Just one more thing on Joshua Sang and anyone like him. There's just some guys that are just talented in a, anything that they do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And according to you, he, he fits the bill now with, with the, the hip hop. Yeah, he's got skills. He does. <laughs> the hip hop. <laughs> he's doing the hip hop. Okay. <laughs> the hipping and, and, and the game, the, the game, the skill. Mm-hmm. When he was like 14, 15, playing in the GTHL, yeah. like, unbelievable. There was talk about him having exceptional status, and this guy was going to be Pat Kane. Yeah, there's an interesting conversation about what ended up going wrong for Josh. You know, some, you know, I, people lack of conforming, but should he have to conform? You know, a lot of debate about how he was treated in the early days, and feels like a guy that should have played more than 53 career NHL games. Yeah, and. Played in the Olympics in 2022, too, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, he's on that Canada team. There are some guys, and I've played f- with a few over my career, too, that just think that however they understand the game or whatever they think that they need to do to get to the next level mm-hmm. is on their terms or they have better ideas of, of what's being um, yes. asked of you For or sure. coached into you. And he appeared for me yep. from my seat watching him over the years and maybe talking to a few people that have dealt with him over the years that this guy just completely marched to his own drum. Well, and what's challenging is like sometimes you get bad coaching. Sometimes people want you to play a way that you shouldn't. On the other hand, sometimes people see something you don't and should see. And so it's hard to know as a player, like I've done it. I've had success everywhere doing it my way. I'm not. Should I be changing it to do it this guy's way? Maybe it's time to get Josh saying on the show. Have a little chit chat about how. Yeah. It went. yeah. I'd I'd welcome him on That'd for sure. Awesome. I'd love right, to hear his story right now. If only we had somebody around here that did that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, some sort a of producer. Producing. Oh, that be you. Oh, okay, I'll try that. All right. That'd put, be him on, you. put him on the list. All right. Day off for the Toronto Maple Leafs yeah. in this uh, the, hour. We talked about Josh saying for five minutes. Edition yeah. of our show. Uh, 
which I think was a really good idea taking off today because yeah. this between Saturday's win against the Montreal Canadiens and playing Thursday night against the Philadelphia Flyers, this will be the last lengthy break mm-hmm. no, is it? between games for the rest of the year. Uh, 18 games to go. Yeah. Nine the rest of this month. Nine in April. And then, boom, puck drop game yeah. one, boys. It's going to be fast. Yeah. And, you know, I know the way Sheldon likes to do his breaks. So they would have played Montreal Saturday night. You know, you get home late Sunday morning, whatever, sleep in. Monday. Gardner, Gardner was open. Gardner is open. Okay. Monday, you come to the rink, you get your treatment, you do all that stuff, check in, watch the video, get that out of the way, and then take the day off. That's a Tuesday. You know, like when you're actually at home, set up so it really feels like rest. I think that's a good way to do it. Now, you would know as much as anyone, you barely practice from here to the end of the season. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, like... I don't think the guys will see a ton of practice time. And this year, they don't have six new guys to indoctrinate. So just a little bit easier to just saw a nice picture of John Tavares and his family down at the uh, from his Instagram down at the CN Tower, walking around and doing a nice sunny day. So gorgeous day today. Gorgeous. 13 degrees. We were talking about when courses open up around <laughs> yeah. here. Oh, it's it's that time of year. Oh, we're starting to get some get the thoughts. <laughs> Boy, it's just that extra hour of sunlight. It's, it's the best crazy. thing. Thank you. Best thing ever. Best day of the year. I walked the dog last night. It's oh, yeah. like 7 o'clock. The sun's up. In a few minutes, we'll welcome in uh, Joshua Cloak, Toronto Maple Leaf writer for The Athletic, and we'll get his thoughts on trade deadline and, and where the Leafs go from here. Also, Jim Ralph. We haven't had Ralphie on in a while, boys. Yeah. Thanks for tracking him down yeah. there, producer of the year. Oh, yeah, thank you. Very yeah, excited you. to have Ralphie So today. we'll get Ralphie's what thoughts. What do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get Ralphie's thoughts on uh, the battle maybe uh, still in the crease. Yep. On, on where he sees it shaping up in the next 18 games. But I don't know where you guys list this in terms of storylines, but Nick Robertson had some choice words to, to say to uh, Terry Koshin of the uh, Toronto Sun mm-hmm. about... Uh, uh, National Post. National Post, sorry. Uh, about being unhappy. Shall I read it? Sure. About be, uh, his being unhappy with his role, I understand it, but I'm not going to sit here and say I'm happy, Robertson said. I want to play, but I understand my contract situation. If it wasn't the way it was, maybe it'd be a different situation, but it is what it is. He's not happy. Yeah, I know. And my first thought is, unless you're Austin, Willie, Mitch, or John Tavares, most of us aren't happy. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? I mean, like, you care to. I've been so worried about how I would phrase this right now, but like, shut up. No, like, I, I, no disrespect for a guy who's a good player. I just mean, in this case, like, just do your part. You're the only guy who could go down. You were nice. Nice, obviously, he's playing the first line. So, yeah, you're the guy. It's the logical thing. It's nothing, whatever. Just do your part yeah. for the team. Be a team guy. Go, yeah, I get it. I, I can't argue with that. No, I can't either. Right? You know, until you, you got 19 points. What, what obligation do they have to, oh, he didn't want to hurt his feelings. Like, it's the National Hockey League. I, I don't think, I don't think uh, that the Leafs just surprised him with sending him down. I, I would imagine they would have had a couple of conversations, including we, we need to do this because we're in a bit of a pickle here. Yeah. But you'll come back up and yes. you'll be in the mix. And, and and here he is. And we got 18 games to go. It's not like we expect you to play zero games in 18. You could be a big part of this thing. We need you. You can still get your opportunities to show that uh, we can't take you out of the lineup. Yeah. Which he didn't necessarily do in the last three weeks. No, it's not like he's grabbed on to some role that they like. You know, we we, we got to keep this guy happy here. I just I just don't like it because it's hard enough between now and game one to really get the team set with their mind, you know, their 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 confidence, their their feeling like we're one, and we still haven't had that yet. Yeah, I, I think these but, eighteen games are really important. 
But feeling like we're one is not the same as 20 guys or 23 guys or more feel like they're equals. Not everyone's equals. You have a role to play. I regret saying shut up. But I don't regret the idea that this is a case just to be the good soldier and say, you know, yeah, they had to do what they had to do. I'm going to come back and grab my spot. You know, like I'm going to be I'm going to be better for it. I was happy to get some development time. It just it just screams out that this is a guy that sh- probably should have or will trade at some point. Like it just feels to me that he should be playing third or but second line not, minutes for the Phoenix Coyotes. Sammy, it's not happening today. It's not happening tomorrow. No. And it's not happening until your season is over. Yeah. So I don't care about that. I care about now you've got a guy back in the room who's unhappy, dragging his lip around, yeah. and how does it affect the rest of the team? Well, this is the thing. is The only thing you do by that is put yourself at risk of the team saying, we'd just rather you not be around if you're going to gonna be a drain energy vacuum. We'd just rather you not be around. And then when you go to the next team, you have a reputation. And I'm so surprised he would put himself in a position like this. Like, the team is struggling now to get back on track and have people believe that they can win a first-round matchup between either Boston or Florida. Mm -hmm. That's the goal between now and game one. And having a guy publicly say, me first is not ideal for this hockey club right now. You know, maybe I've got it all out of context or whatever. You know, I'm not exactly sure. I'm reading the quote, but it's just, there are times there's a pecking order, there's a hierarchy in any sport, not just hockey, in any office space that you walk into. And generally, until you've earned your keep, it's not the right time to... Yeah. Um, I mean, he say. I, I just think. This he, isn't working I think there's for me. ways happy. that he could state he might be a little frustrated, but his his choice of words here really set him up. Yeah. To say that if you're yeah, not I'd happy, I'd rather be in than out. But uh, you know, I'm right? happy to get the work in and looking forward to getting back at it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Uh, as promised, let's bring in Toronto Maple Leaf writer for the Athletic, Joshua Cloak. Last time we saw you, where were Mount Mile Denver, Mountain maybe? High, Denver, Denver, skiing on a patio. He was having pints on a patio. Yeah, <laughs> I was. You, you guys have forced me inside today. Uh, I don't. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> for the rest of the year, you're you got to find a patio for us. Okay, that's that's going to be the deal here uh, moving <laughs> forward. Was, how- it- <laughs> It was a Leafs off day, and I, I was tempted. I really was. I was tempted to. <laughs> you had the to, weather. I'm in, I know, and I'm in, in beautiful Hamilton. I wanted to, but I also didn't want to leave things to chance with some of the Hamilton locals. I think we've we've all spent <laughs> enough time here to know what that might be like, so took it, took it indoors. Josh, we, we, can, go, we can go in um, many directions, and we will, including the deadline for you, but I don't know how much you caught of our conversation about Nick Robertson and how much... How have your dealings been with him over the year? And were you surprised to hear him uh, say that uh, uh, he's unhappy right now with his situation with the Toronto Maple Leafs? No, I'm not surprised to hear that at all. Uh, if only because if, if we're being frank, Nick Robertson is a terrific quote. He always has been. Yeah. Nick Robertson is filled with confidence. Um, and as such, he's not afraid to, to speak his mind. I, I mean, I go back, I've I've covered Nick you know, since he arrived here and, and especially with the Marlies, you know, Nick has never been afraid to to speak his mind. I think back um, to one of the injuries he sustained. And, and I remember going and talking to him with the Marlies and he said, well, throughout my time injured, I never really heard from the Leafs much at all. It was me doing my work to, to recover. Um, and I thought that was pretty inflammatory. You put it in the story. He was called up, I think, two days later. Um, I, I just think it's difficult with Nick Robertson because he does one or two things really, really well. One of them being shoot the puck, you know, his, his shot is, is one of the best on the Leafs. Um, But it's the other elements of his game um, that I don't want to say struggle. They're just a work in progress. And I think Sheldon Keefe's leash with him is is really, really tight. Um, Sheldon Keefe wants all his players to be really defensively responsible. We've seen that this year. We've seen it with him, you know, benching David Camp, benching William Nylander. So if you're Nick Robertson, when you're not scoring, 
um, and then you're not really doing a lot defensively, I, I, I think that's where his lineup position kind of comes into question. Um, is he unhappy? Sure, because I think he knows he can score, and he has scored. He scored a, a lot. He scored at a really decent clip this season. Um, and he has every right to be frustrated because he keeps going up and down. And I think if you're him, you wonder, do I fit in this picture long term under Sheldon Keith? I think it's fair for him to ask questions. I don't know if he's going to get the answers that he wants, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, you know, we were discussing sort of, you know, the team pulling in the same direction. And when you look at this lineup early on, we kind of felt like it was team A and team B. You know, it was like those core guys and a bunch of guys that are kind of taped on. And let's see if this thing, this tail can can be pulled behind the rest of the team A. But it feels a little bit, to me, a little bit more cohesive. Guys have found different roles and you're getting a bit more depth scoring at times. How do you feel about the the, the concept of the lease as a team and their cohesion uh, just a month removed from playoffs? Everything changed that night in Ottawa, didn't it? You know, I I, I know that we love as, as, you know, storytellers to try and think that there was always an aha moment, yeah. something that that where the where the the script flipped and the the plot really began to make sense. Um, it's not always the case. I really think a lot of it was the case in Ottawa. Yeah. I think there were some really ugly and hard conversations within the locker room about what kind of team they want to be. I don't think it's a surprise that after that game, you're seeing some players that were really bubble players uh, really turn a corner, Ryan Reeves being one of them. I think if you're Ryan Reeves, you probably say, well, what what, what am I supposed to be on this team? Um, so I think there were really some, some really difficult conversations. Uh, you look at the seven game win streak that they ripped off afterwards without their their best defenseman in Morgan Riley. And I think you're seeing a lot of players buy into their roles in a way that they hadn't in the beginning of the season. Tyler Bertuzzi's one, Max Domi as well. Um, I thought he looked great on the wing um, against Montreal. I, I think that's where Sheldon Keith wants him to be. And I think it's difficult. You guys both know this. When you're a player that comes into a team, you're so eager to to find your role and to really put your stamp on the team. Sometimes it's as simple as saying, "Well, maybe I'm I'm I have this vision of what I want to be. Maybe it's maybe I'm not going to be that. Maybe if I just do what the the coach kind of asks me to do, it's going to benefit everybody around me." And I think you're seeing a lot of that um, from a number of guys in the team. I mean, you're also seeing guys outperforming you know, their expectations, Bobby McMahon being one of them, right? So I, I think you're seeing, we knew coming into the, this season that the team was very top heavy. And I think you're seeing a little bit of leveling off uh, in terms of your top players, maybe not producing at the clip they were earlier. And then some of those kind of secondary guys raising the bar. When you do that and you find that middle ground, I think that's a better recipe for success, right? We're talking to Joshua Cloak, who follows the Toronto Maple Leafs for the Athletics. So what you sp just spoke of, uh, uh, the Ottawa game, since yeah. then they won seven in a row and nine out of ten. Yet, the following week, two losses to the Boston Bruins. So they got 18 games to go here, Joshua. Is there enough in those 18 games that can keep the, the, the feel real here? Or will we always go back to those last two games against Boston and say, eh, the Leafs are underdogs here? Oh, I think it's the latter. I think they're underdogs here. Mm -hmm. You watch those games. I was at the game. I was in Boston. It wasn't necessarily a lack of effort, but the Bruins just looked like they had an idea of how to win uh, an ugly, tough, physical game that the Leafs were just kind of striving to get to. Um, and Jim Montgomery kind of made an allusion to that after the game. He said in terms of the physicality, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said it was a little too little too late from the Leafs. And you like the, you do like, um, or I'm sure there's a section of the fan base that likes Tyler Bertuzzi dropping the gloves. You like Max Domi going after Brad Barshan. Um, that kind of stuff, that attitude, that physicality, just that... We, we have all these like uh, buzzwords for it, but just that pop, that desire, that needs to come from the beginning. And I think what this Leafs team has been accused of for too long, and I think they can still be accused of it, is kind of waking up 
sometimes in the third period and saying, oh, right, we're a really good team. We have a lot of talent. You know, we saw that in the Columbus games earlier this season, and we saw that in Boston in terms of the physicality they brought. They need to to, to bring that from the start of the game. And I, I think in both Boston games, the Bruins were just so excellent at managing the game, dictating the tempo um, in a way that I just don't think this Leafs team has figured out how to do yet. They did it in uh, their Southwestern road trip against some, you know, kind of marginal teams. They need to figure out how to do it against teams above them in the standings and frankly have a lot more experience than them too, right? Josh, one of the guys that was at that game uh, wasn't able to participate. Uh, Joel Edmondson was watching from up above. He would have helped with a little extra bit of edge knowing his game play. Uh, you have a feature uh, out on him in The Athletic today. Uh, tell us what you learned in doing a feature piece on Joel Edmondson. I learned that you can't really judge a book by its cover because the first time we talked to Joel Edmondson, which was right after the game in Boston, which I found a little confusing that they would give him to us then, but whatever, he just, he, he seemed a little, I don't know, run of the mill. He's obviously in a brand new situation and he, he just seemed very, you know, nice guy, tries hard, loves the game, that kind of guy. Right. Um, but then I, I, I made an effort afterwards to call a number of players that were on that 2019 blues team and Craig Berube as well. And they all essentially said, we don't feel as connected as we did through rounds three and four without a guy like Joel Edmondson. And I know that, you know, again, there's a section of the fan base that finds intangibles like that hard to bear. And, and they don't know if there's a point of that. Um, it reminded me as well of, of conversations I had with a few defensemen uh, on the Golden Knights when they were here a few you know weeks past. And, and they all said the same thing that togetherness that that feeling of you know there's 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 no teammate left behind when you go deep into a playoff run that is so vital because everybody needs to stay bought into what you're doing every single game every single day and Joel Edmondson as I've learned is that guy he's the guy that you know come morning skate you know that during the hours before morning skate he's the guy in the lobby making sure everyone is in good spirits he's the guy that you know, after the game, he's the one organizing everybody to get together. And so everybody feels part of it. He's also the guy that, you know, knows how to have fun. And as I learned, as, as Robbie Thomas told me that that first year that he was there in 2019, he was the one bringing him out. Robbie Thomas is a rookie then. He's the one bringing him out with the veterans. He's the one literally going behind the bar at these restaurants in St. Louis and, and putting in you know, his iPhone and changing the music to, to songs that the blues wanted to hear. These are silly little <laughs> things, but I think to, to keeping a team cohesive, they matter. He checks a lot of boxes, except yep. the one that says he shoots left. <laughs> he shoots with his hand. Yeah. yeah. Right. So what does it's... that do for us guessing the pairs every game from here on in? Well, we were talking about Nick Robertson earlier, and it seems like these guys get grouped together, but Nick Robertson and Timothy Lilligren are guys that have always just been right there on the fringe in terms of really solidifying their spot. The big takeaway for me, that game in Boston, the game in Montreal, is that Sheldon Keefe really wants Timothy Lilligren to work as a right shot defenseman in the playoffs. Exhale. <laughs> I don't know. The, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work. It's a big ask. Um, I think this is a, a role that the player has really wanted. Um, you look at the last two seasons where Timothy Lilligren has continued to ascend. Uh, the trust in him come playoff time hasn't been there. It feels like Sheldon Keefe is kind of saying to Timothy Lilligren, I don't know if I fully trust you yet, but I do trust that you shoot right, and I'm going to give you every opportunity to prove me I don't know if it's right or wrong. Like, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm i going to give you an opportunity here. And I think that he sees Timothy Lilligren as the type of player who, when he has free reign to skate with the puck and skate through traffic in the neutral zone, that's when he's at his best. And he can do that knowing that he has steady Eddie, Joel Edmondson, behind him. It, it's a big ask. That's going to be one of the big questions. And I know we always have questions about Timothy Lilligren. I feel like he's starting to get a bit of a raw deal here in Toronto. He's not in Justin Hall territory yet, but he's the one that I think a lot of 
people and a lot of op opposition teams, opposition forwards are going to have circled as the guy that can he truly fit as that right shot defenseman, not in the regular season, but when things really clench up in the playoffs, it's a big question mark for me. Josh, one more before we let you go, and that is, did Brad Tree Living do a good enough job to prepare Leaf Nation that I can't or nor do I have the assets with me to plug every hole that we're suffering from? Well, I mean, I do think Brad Tree Living um, is a lot better than his predecessor in terms of putting his face out and his voice out in front of the cameras and explaining his position. Kyle Dubas never really loved to to go on the radio shows and 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 do press conferences i think brad is much better at that at, at explaining where he's at and anybody can pull up the leafs cap friendly page and say what what are you supposed to, to to trade away here there was an insistence within the leafs to not trade their first round pick against a, unless a really really good offer came up and and i'm talking about you know the, the players that maybe a lot of leafs fans looked at and said well, why couldn't we get that guy that guy, whoever he was, I guarantee wasn't worth a first round pick in Brad Tree Living's mind. I think he did a good enough job at explaining that he was limited in terms of assets and a good enough job at explaining he values Easton Cowan, he values Fraser Minton, as he should. But now what do you do with that first round pick? Because you better be saving it for a big off-season swing. It really feels like that's what we're building towards. Is Brad Tree Living really sticking his hooks into the roster in the off season, really remaking the blue line for sure. And I think that's when the first round pick is going to come into play come the draft time, because I think he probably looked at what was available and said, I can probably get more out of this pick in terms of it being currency in June than I can now. I, I felt he explained that well enough. I don't know how you guys feel, but I think it's pretty clear. He, he didn't have the assets and he, he knows he didn't. Right. All right, Josh, still plenty of daylight uh, savings time. Son, lose the hoodie. Go find yourself a, a patio. I, now that I've got clearance from you, I, I can... I Just run it by your, your toddler and see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Toddlers are allowed on patios. Yeah, this they are. Really, they are. And pets, you know too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Josh. Anytime, boys. Take All care. Right. See you. Thanks, Joshua. Cloak. Uh... Anything stand out for you in that conversation? I, I had a, yeah, uh, just the difference again, the vibe, much different vibe. I mean, he, that tree living at least got ahead of it. Kyle Dubas never, almost as if Kyle was scared to come out and, uh, and disappoint maybe like he didn't have to get ahead of it right? he landed a, someone for every hole they ever had. They <laughs> brought seven players in last year, six or seven. I, players. Yeah. I, I think, the a huge part of the true living plan is the public perception yeah where like i mean i i respect the guy for coming on our show like he did on deadline day he it does a lot more media availabilities or whatever and he just has been very diligent on getting the message out there that we're broke i think it's we're important. broke we're broke yeah. we're broke yeah. we have nothing we can't pay we can't buy can't do anything we're broke because of the last guy yeah like he, you don't want to put your reputation on the line and make a bad deal just for the sake of appeasing uh, a, a, a crowd that thinks that we're one trade away from winning a Stanley Cup. Which they are not. I, well, think, he, I think he knows that. I don't know. We got a lot of heat yesterday for negativity, boys. I mean, we no, it's yeah. not negativity. It's just I'm, I'm calling not, it the way you see it. I'm not worried about that. I'm saying I think it's the, we talked about half measures leading up to the deadline. And it sounds like rationale and justification for the half cooked. I don't know. We'll spend three or four draft picks and maybe that'll quiet the crowd a bit, but it's probably not enough to put us over the hump. Like if they lose in game seven this year, it's going to be hard to sit here and not be like, Hey, maybe we could have spent that first on someone that made a difference. You mean when? They, like, sure. But uh, what was out there that's going to make them not lose game seven to the Bruins in the first round this year? See, you know, I have a, uh, I have an issue with, people throwing that term out because First. no, just that well, what's out there. Yeah. And Get creative. for you, me, everyone else, you go to your trade list, you see your UFAs. Yeah, we're and all you, reliant you, on and, six insiders. It, it, yeah. 
there's 750 guys in the league. Your job is to find the trade that no one talked about or what's out it's there. Tomas Hurdle. There's everything that's out there, mm. and I assure you, 98 percent of it has a price. Yeah. The question is, can you get creative? Do you have the price? Can you turn something into something that no one else envisioned and no one else thought of? Mm. That's the making of a great general manager. Okay. I mean, not, not you and me sitting there going, ah, there's nothing out there. No, there's there's something only player out there. possible is we, Chris Tanev. We're just not paid to think of it. No one <laughs> like a general manager is. No one was talking about Connor Dewar. Connor Dewar came out of nowhere. Anyways, that's right. Let's nowhere. go to break and get Ralphie. We okay, Connor we're going to go to break. We still got uh, game time, don't we? No, Sammy? we got Ralphie. And then we got game time in the second hour. Oh, gosh. He's checked out, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's off the rails <laughs> Tuesday for Kip. We'll explain more later. Yeah. All right, we're back after these words. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee. One of the most talked about players lately. The New York Rangers, Mac, Matt Rempe, had a situation last night versus New Jersey. And suspension just came in. And we'll talk about uh, Matt. Yeah. And uh, we'll get in a lot more detail on it uh, in our national hour on the top of the show. And we're also going to welcome in uh, Bruce Boudreaux. Yeah. Gabby former NHL coach, one of the most winningest coaches in history. We'll talk about that as well, but uh, w w what's the latest news? Uh, sorry, <laughs> just listening to Derek in my ear. Um, you got four games. Four games. Four games for elbowing. This is elbowing. Boy, was that elbowing. Substantial force, up <laughs> and away, not accidental, injury on the play, 10 games into his career. All right, uh, let's welcome in another guy who probably should have been suspended once or twice in his pro career. Uh, Jim Ralph, is he available or is he still fixing his hair? That was the word we got. He's still doing his hair. But looking for the picture there, he looks all right. Oh, he, his hair looks great in the still picture. They're not moving. That, um, oh, beautiful. Yes. <laughs> you know, one day we're going to get you on a Zoom call. You know that, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, my Zoom's been out for three months now. <laughs> <laughs> Post-pandemic at nine. <laughs> hey, just the mere fact that you you've heard of zoom is a good start for you <laughs> yeah i kept uh, like doing two fingers on the screen and pulling them apart and that usually works <laughs> so what's it like for you and um and and bonesy when they're off like for three or four days because for us on our leaf edition it, it sucks yeah yeah it, it gets a little uh tiresome of the days off but it's um on the other side, I mean, you know, they, what, five games in eight days? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, they went, uh, uh, yeah, in a good stretch. And I, th I, thought, I just thought they were out of gas last week in all the games. Um, you know, even uh, uh, even the ones they were able to win, like the Montreal game on Saturday. So I think it's uh, it's a much, much needed rest for them to, to recharge and get back at it. I'm actually so excited to have you on the show. It's been tragic not having you on more. I, I want to know your thoughts. Where are the Leafs at, Ralphie? Where, where is this team compared to previous years of the Leafs for you? Uh, I actually like them. Probably, okay. you, know, uh, you know, better than, than other years coming in. And um, you know, I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but I've said it to Joe. Um, I like the fact that they're they're going to open on the road this year. I like the fact that they're going to go into a playoff series and they're going to say whether it's Boston or Florida, they got absolutely no chance, and uh, they're, they're the underdogs. I mean, what's it been five straight playoff series? They've had home ice advantage, and they went one and four or one and five on home ice last year. Uh, you know, the death of this team always seems to be expectations, and as soon as you you write them off or you say they're done or they're the underdogs, they they seem to surprise you. So. Um, I, I don't think the, the plan going into the week was to lose both games to Boston, but there's something about it that uh, I think if they would have beat Boston both games, I would have been maybe a little more concerned for what's ahead in the next month or so. R Ralphie, I, I agree. I totally agree. I, 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 I don't mind the, the underdog uh, feeling or us against the world, and it, it has worked on occasion, and you hope it can for the Leafs, but a team that's put consecutive years of over 100 points, I, I would have thought this year that they wouldn't have to play that card. So let me ask you something, though. W what is it in their lineup that has led them to this underdog feeling for you? Where, where are they still vulnerable that 
no one's going to give them a chance against Boston or or Florida for you for you. Well, I just think it's a recent history, Kip. You know, they had uh, you know home ice over Montreal and lost home ice over Tampa uh, the first time and lost. Then it was thank God we got Florida instead of Boston last year. They lost Columbus in the bubble. Uh, you know, they were the favorites in that. Uh, so I mean, I, I think it's their history more than anything, Kip. That um, you know, when they've they've gone in with these high expectations, and this is the year, and they got Riley, and they got uh, Luke Shen, and uh, they're deep, and Nola Chari, and Nick Foligno before that. Um, you know, and that, that and that's kind of the other thing that um, you know whether whether it turns out to be a benefit or not going into the playoffs as an underdog. Um, when you look at you know people complaining about what other teams did and other moves and uh, you know how great their teams are now that they've they've been able to stock up. Um, go ahead and read through Conn Smythe Trophy winners. Uh, they're not mid-season pickups. They're Kale McCarr, they're uh, Victor Hedman, Andre Vasilevsky, Sidney Crosby, Alexander Ovechkin. Eventually, your your top player has to be holding the cup in the Conn Smythe Trophy, uh, whichever one that is. But it's um, you know it's not about uh, necessarily the the, pair, the spare parts that are going to come in and save you. And I think now you're in a position where um, you know, you got to find out what you've got and who can elevate their game. And um, they've had enough kicks at it to find out. But scoring. There, I found one for you. But he wasn't that year, was <laughs> no, he? I don't know. A couple years later, ever get him? <laughs> what was that, 1970, <laughs> not 81, 82? Yeah. And you know what? And but, Butch is the reason for all these um, trade deadline shows, too. <laughs> yeah. There's never been a better one since than uh, the Butch Goring pickup by the Islanders. Yeah. Even, you know, even when Ray Bork went to uh, to Colorado from Boston, they didn't win the year he went. They, yeah. won, they won the following year. Yeah. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. That's, uh, right about that. So, um, so then it's April 20th today. Uh, the Leafs are playing no. the Bruins. No, I'm just saying. It's the Bru- oh, Leafs okay. are playing the Bruins in game one in Boston. <laughs> Who's your goalie? Well, first of all, I, you scared me because I thought I forgot my son's birthday again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> scared me too. <laughs> threw a lot of people off of the time warp there. Sorry. Uh, I, I mean, right now, I think um, obviously Samsonov has the edge, but I, uh, I'm, I'm, I've always been a big fan of Joe Walsh, and I, I don't think he's he's quite back to the level he was, um, you know, when he got hurt. And uh, I, I think that's pretty understandable for from a goaltender's perspective. You don't play for three months. I mean, I was healthy and I didn't play for three months and it would hurt, you know, once you got back in. So um, I, I tell you right now, uh, Borny, uh, Sam Snow's got the edge, but um, I think it's going to be pretty interesting down the stretch to see um, who ends up becoming the favorite between the two of them. But, and let's face it, it's, it's uh, a nice problem to have um, as opposed to, my God, we don't have anybody. Mm. You know, it would be a nice little competition, I think, down the stretch. Is it a um, is it a real fair competition here though, Ralphie? In a perfect world, would we not think that Leaf management would be leaning towards Joseph Wall because both these guys, if if they're playing well, one really resonates a calmness that the other one doesn't. And how important would that be in the playoffs for you? Oh, very much so, and that's why even you know not not that you wanted to get hurt last year, but when uh, when Wall went in against Florida, when Samson off was hurt, um, I didn't feel any sense of panic because you know you're down three nothing in a playoff series. Uh, sometimes a goalie change is, is something that can you know turn things around and spark it. And, and we love Joseph Wall the way he played down the stretch last year, and uh, if he can get anywhere close to that, uh, I agree with you. I mean, I think. You know, as opposed to the guy that's an unrestricted free agent, um, you know, you you hope you could, uh, you know, have success developing your own. And, you know, whether Hildebees, you know, close to, to elevating himself to the next level remains to be seen. But, uh, yeah, I, I think if if it's a tie, uh, Joseph Wall might at least start. But, but it also gives you options if somebody struggles early in a playoff series. You know, part of the, I would say this, plays into your theory a little bit. Part of what I like is that there isn't some new group of forwards to say, oh, their leadership is going to, you know, take over the team or their goal scoring is going to make the difference. It is squarely on Marner and Matthews and Willie and Tavares to a lesser extent too. How do you feel about 
where those guys are at. Are, are they finally ready at this stage of their career to have a playoff run where they, uh, frankly, beat the other team's best players? And it hasn't happened all, you know, a ton. Yeah, no, I mean, now is every year you say it's the time. And uh, now, like I said, Borny, the, and I like the fact that uh, now people are going to say no chance against Boston. You know, they've lost three straight playoff series to them. Um, now, you've also got to remember Boston's had old mice in the previous three uh, series as well. But, you know, they've all gone seven games. And uh, uh, I would say that this Leafs team is is now better prepared to, to play the Bruins in a playoff series than before. Do I think it will be easier that it's a slam dunk that they could win? No. But I'd say, um, you know, I, I like the uh, – I love the Edmondson uh, acquisition. Uh, Connor Dewar, I guess we'll, you know, see where he fits in once you get Marner back in the lineup and uh, you have to reshuffle the lines. But, um, you know, I, I like the fact that they've they've got guys that are considered a little more dangerous back there. You know, you mentioned the five five games in eight nights. Uh, maybe the, the break has been good now uh, between Saturday and Thursday. Matthews in a cold spell, I think two and eight, if I'm not mistaken, is no no Marner like when you look back at his season and the torrid pace that he had and the constant push on can he get to 70 can he get to 75 can he did that kind of overwhelm him a little bit up, up until this point uh, I don't know if it's overwhelmed Kip um, you know I, I will say and a lot of it goes to the goal celebrations um, I don't know if it means that much to him to hit a milestone in the regular season. Um, you know, he's done it with 60 um, a couple of years ago. And, you know, you don't ever, you know, the, his celebrations in games that are blowouts when he's had his hat tricks are very minimal. You know, they're not all about, yay, I got them one closer to the next milestone. Um, so I, I don't know if I put that much importance on, you know, hitting 70 or, or things like that. I think, you know, for Austin Matthews, it's um, you know you're going to be judged like Doug Gilmore and Wendell Clark and the guys before you, and that's having some success in the postseason. So, um, you know, I it, it was pretty incredible, and and I mean, even though we say this, he could turn around and end up with you know another five or six goals in the next two games, and we're talking about it again. Yeah, no, it's uh, it definitely has tailed off a little bit, but I, it has been something to see which goals he celebrates and which ones he doesn't. Um, all right, so, you know, they've got sort of 18 games down the stretch here. It doesn't seem likely to, that they can catch Boston. It doesn't seem likely that they can get caught from the other direction either. So what is it you want to see them do? What should they accomplish or Sheldon Keefe accomplish with this lineup between now and a month from now? I, I think it's more mix and match the line combinations. Um, you know, when you'll find some chemistry with the penalty killers, whether Dewar fits in there or not, and... Um, you know, I, I think that's what it does. It gives you that uh, little bit of a luxury to, to tinker with things. And, you know, hopefully the last week um, of the regular season going into the playoffs, uh, you found combinations or even backup combinations that you can go to if it's if it's not working. So uh, I think that's the advantage. And, and, you know, we've seen the Leafs in a similar position when they've been in second, you know, where they've had, you know, two or three weeks before the playoffs to try to, get things settled in. But I, I think that's the main thing. It's um, uh, you don't have to ride the hot goalie because uh, you need wins every night. Uh, so you can get that competition going to see who's sharper. And, uh, but yeah, they're, you know, with, with, with some of the additions, you still have to figure out the line combinations at work and, you know, what the, what the backup plans are that we've seen Sheldon Keith go with before, whether it's loading up Marner with uh, Matthews and Nylander at times, um, I, I think it gives you that luxury to to test those out. Does Jimmy Ralph's Toronto Maple Leafs uh, have John Tavares centering the second line? Uh, well, I'm, let's put it this way: I don't like uh, David Cam from the third line, and and I think that's where the uh, the thing comes in. Um, I think Max Domi's been much better at center than on the wing, um, so that would be my preference. Whether you know. You want to say Tavares is two or three. I just like the depth uh, down the middle when, when it's uh, Matthews, Domi, and, and Tavares. And, you know, then, like we said, then the makeshift lines come in. Uh, where do you put Dewar? Where do you put Camp? 
Um, you know, where do you put Holmberg if he's in the lineup? So uh, those are the things that, to me, are going to be interesting uh, to see what Sheldon Keith comes up with. Hey, Ralphie, welcome back, buddy. Too long. Good to have you. Okay. We're going to send you a camera, uh, you know, too, for Zoom. You know, IR. <laughs> you know, got... Enjoy the rest of the season, <laughs> Ralphie. Appreciate it. Hey, and you know what? I played most of my career hurt, too. I'm not, I'm not looking for sympathy, but that's how... I saw some guys had hat tricks. <laughs> yes, yeah, Jim Ralph, <laughs> Thanks, Toronto Maple Leaf Radio you. color analyst and uh, all round good, funny guy. L- long lost friend of the show. There, yes, yeah. yeah. I God, I love his take because like, I haven't really voiced that take about the Bruins thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if they'd beaten them twice, it's like, oh boy, they're gonna. It's just my number one, which is bad. That this is my number one argument for why the Leafs would beat them. It's because sports are weird and unexpected things happen all the time, especially in the playoffs. I would That's say like also my Ralphie's number point, one though, argument. the Leafs, you know, we've learned their trends. They, right when you think they're down and out yep. is when they play their best game, 100%. right? 100%. It's a dumb league. Bingo. <laughs> it's a dumb league. Bingo. But it I mean, if everyone league. had that take, all of a sudden they would become not no, underdogs to, anymore. <laughs> so we need to suppress the take. For 32 teams have that opening puck drop. Well, that's coming the, out of training camp. They've got the best team. They they need a little luck. I think eighty two games is a long season to give you a true identity of what's what what you can count on and what might be a crapshoot. And what you can count on with this Leafs team is when they're supposed to win, they lose, and when they're supposed to be a laughing stock and blow it all up, they go on a tear. I mean, that is an undeniable fact. Every game yeah. they should win, they are embarrassed. Until you get in the, <laughs> until you get in the playoffs, right? You're you're, you're talking. No, it's no. You're, they're wrong because they've where, been favorites where? in five straight series. And they lose. They need to be dogs. Yeah, but you have no proof that when they're underdogs, or that they, they it, come Kippy. through. Well, they were underdogs. Where's where that based on uh, their history? You're right. In the ra- in the playoffs as underdogs, so they, they haven't Washington. been underdogs since when? They're good against Washington. But they they were good against here. Washington seven years ago. We, you, you, Listen, I, I want to remind you, like, they've had a couple of at-home chances to win. A couple, yeah. Right? Yeah, a couple. And. Yeah, right it, when they're supposed to the, do it. Yeah. The, the. And they weren't underdogs. <laughs> and they weren't underdogs. No, that's the problem. Right? They were favorites. The problem is, is like, as every series goes, you become... Yeah, when you're up a three, favorite three wins and an and underdog, and, yeah. and it's like yeah. it's ebbs and flows. It's just a very delicate advance. flower. Yeah. Anyways, listen, I I don't mind it. I it it can work psychologically. It can work, but a lot of things have to go right for sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, no, uh, no Tortorella on. That's his second. That will be his second uh, game suspension Thursday night. Oh yeah, against the Leafs. He's yeah. not. He's not behind the bench. He will be. Is it here or is it in Philly? I think it's here. Oh, my God. Can we get him on? Well, there's just nobody more heartbroken. They don't get to hear the sound of their own voice in the Toronto media. No, uh, or is it in Philly? It might be in Philly. Yeah, it's in Philly. Yeah. Is it? Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a tough building, no matter what. That's going to be a tough one, too. And, you know, Torts will be in that room just jacking them right up. Because no, he won't be. He can't be. I don't think you get to do coaching activities if you're, like, he could be in his office. Sure. Was he going to send a text? And who, and if he, if he comes out of his office and goes and talks to the team, who's who's going to know about Suspend it? Suspend him again! Hey, have you guys seen the Metro schedule the Leafs have yeah, come up? Yeah, all Metro teams. Flyers, Hurricanes, Flyers, Capitals, Hurricanes, Devils, Capitals. There's actually an Oilers yikes, in the middle yikes, there, but yikes. two Flyers, two Canes, two Caps. All Metro's the next not three. very good, are they? Well, Hurricanes might be the best. Yeah. All that right, we're going to get into that much more. Bruce Boudreaux. After the break, as Real Kipper and Bourne goes national, and including off the top, Matt Rempe suspended four games. We're going to get into great detail on our thoughts of Rangers against the Devils last night. That led to it. You're watching, you're listening to Real Kipper and Bourne. We're back our national hour of the real kipper and born show we are live on sportsnet sports at 650 in vancouver and sportsnet 960 in calgary this hour real kipper and born 
brought to you by Bet365. In a few minutes, we're going to welcome in former NHL head coach Bruce. There it is. Bruce. Boudreaux. Gabby. Tons to get into. Yes. Including John Hines pulling the goalie three on three. Matt Rempe suspended four games. His Washington Capitals are in a are they in a playoff race or are they not? I mean, they wouldn't tell you they are, but they got yeah. starched by a good team last night. They got punked. They did. They did. Okay. Uh, we teed it up uh, in our previous hour. Rangers forward Matt Rempe suspended four games for an elbow to defenseman from the New Jersey Devils, Sagan Thaler. Mm -hmm. In the yeah. second period last night, we were anticipating a Curtis McDermott battle with him. It didn't come to fruition. And then the elbow that uh, led to a four-game suspension. JB, yeah. we'll start with you. Wouldn't fight McDermott. They literally traded for a guy to fight Rempe after he took five in a game on Nathan Bastion. Bastion yeah. for a dirty hit. So they trade for a guy to fight Rempe. Rempe won't fight him. So then Rempe goes out and brains Siegenthaler and then waves at McDermott on the way off, mm -hmm. which didn't love any of that. The hit for Department of Player Safety when they're going through the list are like, you know, coming at him from a blindside <laughs> angle. His elbow is up, moving up and away. There is significant force. There is injury. It's a brutal hit. Game 10 for this kid, two majors, ejected, suspension, four fights, like four games. Yeah, I, I should say he needs some cooling off time. Go sit in your room for a bit, son. Yeah, I'm going to have to wholeheartedly agree. I think it is a little t harder to hit guys when you're six foot eight. Sure. But he got the chicken wing out pretty good, yeah. clipped him hard. I, I, four games is the right number. I thought it could have been uh, maybe three. It wasn't in per it wasn't in person, so they're not going above it or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I love what this kid represents. I love that he's like a new same. guy. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, it feels yeah, like we, we all do. It feels like it needs a bit of a like you said, <clears throat> just go sit down. For I uh, I'm not overly surprised at the four games. Usually, it's two games, and then it's one extra game if there's an injury. But I really believe that there was one more game added on to. So they wanted to send a really stern message to a guy that's caused three head injuries in the last in 10 games, two weeks. Yeah. Like excited about what he could be, but what he is is currently dangerous. Okay, yeah. let's welcome him in. Bruce Boudreaux, former NHL head coach, 617 career wins. Doing some great stuff now in the media. Gabby, we're just talking about a guy like Matt Rempe and how he came gangbusters into the league and now finds himself suspended uh, four games. So before we get into any more detail, just give us your early thoughts of uh, hearing four games. Well, I just think the league, I, I think I was listening to you just now, and, I mean, they're saying, whoa, slow down, young man. Like, I mean... <laughs> You know, like, I mean, you're coming in here like gangbusters. We're not going to let you run, rule the roost right now. We've been trying to get this stuff out of the game, and you're coming in and, and changing the landscape again. So I think uh, if this was just, say, a normal guy, I think it would have been one or two games. But uh, I think they're trying to send a message to this young man that, uh, cool it, just cool it. I know you're big, and this is, and you're popular as hell right now in New York, but... Uh, uh, this is just calm down, kid. Gabby, I I saw someone say that I think he fought just 11 times in 157 junior games or something like that. Like, you know, once every 15 games or so. And, you know, none of these sorts of hits. But, you know, what, what is it right now that he feels like he has to do this to sh to stay in the league? Is it necessary that he be playing the way he is for him to be impactful? Well, I think, first of all, in junior, he's bigger than everybody. Who's going to fight him? That's and, a great I mean, point. A lot of, Curtis McDermott. A lot of the guys are, That's who's are fight him. younger, too. You know, like now he's against men. Yeah. And all the, all these guys that have done it for a living, especially the first couple game when you see Delorier and Olivier, they're going, oh, my God, we've got a new piece of meat in here. Let's try <laughs> this new guy. You know, let's uh, uh, let's take care of this guy. But uh, um, And at the same time, he's become... Uh, incredibly popular in New York. And, uh, you know, like, I mean, uh, Peter's 
uh, sending him out there to change um, change momentums of games. And I, I think he's going, you know what? If I can continue to do this and do this well, I'm going to make some money in this league. So, I mean, I think he's liking what he's doing. And the league is just saying, okay, you know, calm down a little bit right now. I want to get your thoughts and maybe uh, JB yours as well here in terms of what I'm hearing in, in the last little while from various uh, uh shows podcasts uh what i've seen on the internet is that he rempe didn't follow the code and uh if if he would have accepted the fight maybe earlier from curtis mcdermott maybe this might have not led to a a head injury maybe maybe not but where are you on the fact that he he declined the invitation of curtis mcdermott to to start the game um I would have bet that Peter said, I don't want you going out there fighting right now because a young guy that's been in the game, league 10 games, he's listening to his coach. Like, I mean, you saw him in Toronto. He looked over at his coach and said, should I fight this guy? And uh, like, I mean, uh, they're, they were going to say McDermott was brought here only for the reason of fighting you fight him on your terms. Kipper, you've been there many times, you know, like, I mean, Putting the, putting the guy in the position where uh, it's your advantage type thing rather than uh, fighting him that he wanted, probably McDermott wanted New Jersey to get going right off the bat, and why give him that satisfaction? Now, me, I've never been, fought a soul in my life. I can't, couldn't beat up my wife. But, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> so I probably wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have accepted it either. But, I mean, in the code, you've been fighting everybody else. You know, let's, you know, you're on the ice and I'm on the ice. We both know what should happen and maybe he should have done it. Off those words, Sammy, do we have Curtis McDermott's um, soundbite after the game? We do. Derek, you got that? Let's play that real quick here. First shift, I asked him. um, There's a bit of a code and I think he, I thought he would have answered that, but I don't know what he was told, but he said no. And, um, you know, after a hit like that, you know, it kind of goes without saying you should answer the bell in some way um, and be a man about it. Um, and then game goes on, then he throws another hit like that, get, gets kicked out and um, hospital suspension. So there's a right, right, right way, go about things in a wrong way. And, um, you know, I kind of lost uh, a lot of respect for him tonight. Now, uh, I didn't hear all the clips from uh, post game. Did Peter Laviolette say anything publicly about that? I, I would hope if if the instructions were to Matt Rempe to don't fight him, I would hope my coach would have my back and 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 say, listen, I'm just I'm following my coach's rules or decisions. I'm not sure if anything was said or not. Well, I don't I don't know if anything was said. I I do think this though. I think um, uh, Peter wanted him to fight against Ryan Reeves. Uh, um, you know, when they, they were down 3-2, they were looking for a little jump. I mean, he kept them on after the 35-second mark with a face-off in their zone, down 3-2. to two. So, I mean, I'm thinking I'm thinking at that point he, w- he wanted the jump, but uh, uh, at this time, Ethan, let's do it on our terms, I guess. I, d- I don't know, for a young guy not to accept it, though, Kipper, don't you think that that's sort of the wrong way to go about it when he's doing this to everybody else? Listen, um, in the year 2024, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell somebody he should fight if he thinks he shouldn't fight. Like, there's so much risk here. It's such a personal decision to drop your gloves. Okay. But but I'm just saying from Bruce's comments, listen, I took out a Hall of Fame goaltender in Grant Fuhr. Okay? I didn't fight Tony Twist the rest of the playoffs, but I sure as hell knew what was coming the next season. Mm-hmm. And the first game we played against St. Louis, Ty's like, you don't have to fight him. And I'm like, no, I have to fight him. Okay? Because I'm not going to have everybody tell me that I hurt a Hall of Fame player and I didn't answer to it. Mm-hmm. Me personally, I thought... Rempe needed to take that fight against McDermott just based on the fact that there was so much history on taking out uh, uh, Bastion. Bastion. Yeah. So 
in, in the old days, for me personally, I would have had to have said, I can't move forward. People will lose respect for me if I didn't take that fight and answer to my own doing. So to Bruce's point, yes, there's a, there's a certain message here saying, listen, if you're going to run around like a human missile out there, like someone's going to eventually call you out on it. Like maybe, maybe if you don't take the fight, which again, it's your choice not to, but here are the ramifications. People are going to lose a little respect for you. Yeah, Bruce, have you ever coached anyone like this before? Have you had to deal with players where, you know, there's the expression, uh, better to tame a tiger than paint stripes on a pussycat? You know, this is really a tiger they're trying to tame. Have you had players like that where it's tough to rein them in? Well, listen, I had George Peros right after he, he uh, uh, left Princeton, and uh, he came to Manchester with me, and uh, you know what? Like, I didn't tell him to fight or whatever, but he fought every game. He wanted to prove that he was a, that a tough guy, and he did prove that he was a tough guy. But, I mean, it was he was looking for it right from the beginning, and and you'd have to sort of rein him in. The the one guy I had to rein in was my line mate was Mick Vakoda. Oh, back yeah. in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, he fought in 22 straight games in the American League. It was 22 straight Mickey. games? I think that's a record, yes. Because I, I remember grabbing him and saying, Mick, you do not have to fight every shift out there. You know, and he ended up becoming a pretty solid NHL player for a long time. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, every team has guys that uh, that know um, that that's their job. I've coached Donald Brashear and uh, been on a team with Marty McSorley and all of those guys. They know they they know like i mean that's part of the job it's not their own job we want them to play hockey but it is it is part of their job and uh, uh, i mean it was uh, years ago but uh, uh and i think this rampy knows that that's part of his job he wouldn't be up there if they were <clears throat> if they were in uh looking for a playoff spot and they needed a, uh, they lost panera and he wasn't he's not going to be the guy that's called up so i mean he knows what uh, what he has to do to if he wants to stay in the NHL. I think. Gabby, were you gone by the time Tom Wilson got to Washington? I they had drafted him, but I hadn't coached him. I was gone when he came up the next. Okay, year. and and I'm not I'm not comparing Tom Wilson to Rempe, but there's a lot of people screaming that Tom Wilson was nothing but a goon when he first came in. I don't know if he had two goals in 80 games. And people were sitting there, get get rid of him, get him out of the league. I'm not saying that Rempe's going to turn into Tom Wilson, but there is some upside in Matt Rempe. But he's 21. Moving forward here um, on, on a, on a forecheck, on a skate, on a eventual maybe 10 goals. I, I don't know, but there's so much upside here that uh, to, to Justin's point, maybe it's just curtailing him a little bit and uh, and trying to trying to work with him, but there's so much upside still on this guy. Absolutely. Like, I mean, he can skate. He's six foot eight. He's got a, a great reach. He doesn't mind going to the hard areas. And when you've got a, and you know yourself, when you've got a guy that can be physical and can play the game and you can end up putting him out there in defensive zone situations and that, boy, you've got a real find. And that's what I think Washington thought of when, Tom Wilson was running around. Yeah, we got to rein him in a little bit. But if we work with this guy in a couple of years, he's going to be a really good player. Yeah. Um, good to turn page here. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, coach-referee dynamics. Seen John Tortorella recently get, gets kicked out of a game, doesn't leave the bench. Here in Toronto, we see Sheldon Keefe getting upset with the refs a lot and just never seems to get the benefit of the doubt with officials. You know, what is the art of those relationships and managing them and when to step on referees because it feels like some coaches today have kind of lost that art. You've never stepped on a referee, have you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been kicked out a couple of times. Have you been kicked out? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I got kicked out, warned. I, I got kicked out in the American League and the, and, uh, and the East Coast League. I hadn't got kicked out in the NHL, but I, I started to learn your lesson that you get a lot more with sugar than you do with vinegar. Yeah. In other words, if you're going to uh, F, uh, F these referees all night, they, they're people, they're going to do it right back to you. They are not going to give you a break. 
So I found out, even though they're wrong when I'm arguing with them, because I always feel like I'm right. Of course. Uh, that at the same time, you have to talk to them. And I remember, like, I mean, I've had some great relationships. Uh, one, Paul Dvorsky, I had a great relationship with. Um, you, you get to know these guys and you, you just ask them and you say, what, did it, what was wrong? I want you to look at it, tell me about it. But when you start, you know, uh, giving the, you know, F-bombing them all night long, they're just going to turn away. I found that out early because I would do it. And you'd never get the break on the call. But sometimes if you treat them right, you might get a break every now and again. We're talking to Bruce Boudreau, former NHL head coach, now analyst with the NHL Network. Uh, can we ask you what you thought of uh, pulling the goalie on a three-on-three in overtime, John Hines? Like, I mean, when I started thinking of the reasonings and how he did it, I thought it was really, really smart. I think we all want to do it as coaches. None of us have, uh, a lot of us don't have the, <laughs> the cojones to do it. But, I mean, when you think, think about the fact that on a three-on-three, they don't have their three best penalty killers out there. They're probably using uh, two forwards and a defenseman that don't know how to kill a five-on-three, don't know how to put their sticks in their lane. And he did it with a minute to go. He understood the ramifications. They had full control four on three against guys that can't kill penalties when you've got a good power play. I think it's well worth the gamble. Yeah, and paid off, and so tough to uh, second-guess it now, isn't it, when when you get the W like that? Um, well, we, we wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, Washington Capitals. Not sure if you're following along with them uh, too closely. Last night they lost to the hands of the Winnipeg Jets, but kind of in a weird spot, right? I mean, they're they're kind of in the playoff chase. They They didn't really add at the deadline. You know, it just feels like they're one of those teams that's kind of spinning their wheels a little bit right now. Well, it's funny you ask that. I'm in Washington doing the, I was doing the Caps game last night. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought Winnipeg might have played the best game I've seen a team play all year. Yeah. They were in, they were in their face. They were, uh, they, they, they didn't give them a chance to breathe. And, and, uh, and they had many chances to score. It could have been the score was actually very uh, flattering to the Caps. But, I mean, I think the Caps are they're three points back, and um, uh, they got a really tough schedule this week. I mean, they're in Edmonton next, then Seattle, then Vancouver, then Calgary, and all teams are above 500. So, I mean, um, we were talking last night, like, for them to keep in it, I think they have to be 500 or better when they come off this trip. But... Uh, I mean, they're a team, followed them all year, and, and and they've been really resilient. Every time you think they're out of it, they win two or three in a row. I mean, uh, uh, most of the talk has been Alex about not scoring, but they play a good defensive game, and if they get in the lead, if they get the lead in the first period, they're pretty tough. Now, personally, I don't know if they've. Uh, it's going to be a tough uphill uh, battle uh, when there's a couple teams that you have to climb over. But uh, and they've got, uh, according to last night, they have the toughest remaining schedule in the league. I mean, and and that means they're playing teams with the better records coming into the last 19 games or what have you. So, I mean, I think they're a team that won't quit, but I just don't know if they have enough that they just might miss by one or two. Gabby, Rick Tockett uh, uh, made comments after today's practice about Demko being out week to week, but he wouldn't divulge much else on it uh if you were still on the bench <laughs> in vancouver and you lost demko what could be four to six weeks with under 20 games to go how, how nervous would you be well i lost him last year for 10 weeks and how did i make out <laughs> I mean, like, like, he had he had hip surgery last summer and then he got hurt in the 12th game of the year, and he didn't come back uh, until after I was gone. I mean, he's a great goaltender. I mean, now Vancouver's went out and, and made some significant changes to their defense. But, uh, and you know what, uh, uh, DeSmith is, is, a lot, is, is a pretty good backup goalie. But the, the bottom line, if you have to go with the one goalie for six weeks, it's, you know, they're firmly in a playoff position. To me, the biggest thing is getting Thatcher 
back into uh, form by the by the start of the playoffs. Like they're going to call up a guy by, by Siloffs, I think is his name, um, and he hasn't had a great year in Abbotsford, but he was uh, uh, in the World Championships last year, really really good for Finland. So. Uh, but I would be worried because when we lost Demko, man, we lost everything, I think. And the, the team is much better now, and I think they'll survive it. But uh, it would it would make me worry. I don't know what the injury is. hope it's not anything to do with last year's injury or the, the surgery he had in the summer. Bruce, do, I don't know if you had any uh, deadline additions that were meaningful to any teams that you coached. Um, looking at this year's trade, de- trade deadline, the Leafs were very cautious. Uh, added a couple of sort of steady defenders to it. Well, what is the experience like trying to integrate new players to a club when you only have a month to go until crunch time? Well, I don't think it's difficult uh, um, one or two players. Yeah. I mean, when you start talking six and seven players or a third of your team, I think it, it becomes difficult. I remember in the minors, as a matter of fact, when I was in Manchester, we had a great team, but Half the team was uh, up uh, in L.A. at the time, and they sent uh, five guys down after their season was over, and they didn't really want to be there, and it, and it really hurt us. I've also been, you know, where uh, I've had, um, I've asked George McPhee, I said, I think we need this position, and he went out and got Sergei Fedorov, which was a tremendous a- add to us, and it worked out. Uh, um, when I was in Mini, we went out and tried to, um, we were first overall at the time, and we went out and got Martin Hansel, but the, it really threw off the chemistry of the things. And and uh, I mean, we didn't make too many moves in Anaheim at the deadline, but it's a really touchy situation. Is touching, you know, fooling around with something that's working right now and trying to make yourself better, keeping up with somebody that looks like, oh, oh they just made a big move. We've got to make a big move. But I, I really believe in the... Uh, in the chemistry of the team, if you're going good, it'll continue to go good. Let's not upset the chemistry. So I don't think as long as you're a GM and you show you're trying and you're tweaking it and and, and you, you want to make the team a little bit better and then you don't really upset the apple cart, I think you're doing good. But I think if you go out and get a lot of big players and at the look at the Rangers last year with Tarasenko and Kane, it didn't work out there. But, I mean, that's where I'm thinking that – it upsets the apple cart more than it does uh, it help you sometimes. Okay, in saying that, uh, who has a bigger immediate impact on their hockey club? Hannafin in Vegas or Gensel in Carolina? Well, I think uh, Carolina doesn't have anybody like Gensel. They've never had the 40-goal scorer. They've had a really good team. They got a, you know, Ajo's a really good player, but he's not the dynamic guy. I think Gensel's going to be a really impactful player there, but and Hannafin's going to be a really, really steady guy that already is going to fix, uh, uh, mix in with a, a really good defense. I mean, uh, I'm, you're going to see a shutdown pair of Hannafin and Peter Angelo, and that's uh, that's good. And those are also guys that are offensive at the same time. I think that's going to be a pretty tough, pretty tough group to beat. But I, I really like <clears throat> the Gensel move, and uh, I, I just think it, it, as a player and, and a star coming over, it's something that Carolina hasn't had, and I, I think that's he's going to really do a good job there. Gabby, really appreciate your time, man. Thanks for doing this for us. No problem, guys. You have a great day. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate it. No Bruce problem. Bruce Boudreaux, former NHL head coach. One of the winningest guys in our game. 617. <laughs> Never get him in the same place twice. And the last time he was like in his like bar area in his place. I know. Was, you know and I don't know if there was like a mini uh, earthquake or something but for those of you that didn't watch him on zoom his camera wouldn't stop shaking <laughs> so we, we have a we have a monitor to the side here and like i couldn't watch it too long or else i was getting <laughs> nauseous a little turbulence <laughs> anyway that guy i mean what i could you know he could sit in your chair nick and i'd be very happy <laughs> he's got something on everything he's awesome yeah, yeah no it was great stuff uh, uh yeah go ahead well no i just go ahead 
that's definitely important. I was just going to just pick up on Gensel uh, making his debut tonight yeah. against the New York Rangers, Carolina Rangers. I don't know. They, they they never confirm, right? They're like, well, we'll see. He takes warm up. I know. Like who? Wait, guy takes warm up, knowing that he's not playing. Yeah, it's a week removed from the deadline, he's there. He's in equipment. They're like, well. Oh yeah. god, it's just the goofiest thing to say. Um, but you know, Carolina, and by some models that I've seen, uh, has moved into cup favorite status. Part of that being that the top of the East is not as heavy as top oh of the gosh. West. Oh my gosh, how could you ever pick Carolina with the questionable goaltending? Yeah, Freddie, 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 Freddie Anderson. Freddie still plays net there? Like, Freddie Anderson Freddie, is not. Until I mean, you, you get over the hump. Um, you I, want Samsonoff or Freddie Anderson? Uh, none. Zero <laughs> the I'll take Wall over. Listen, I would take Wall over Freddie Anderson ten times out of ten. He's a good goalie, like Samsonov here. He's a good goalie, yeah. but you gotta, you gotta protect him. Well, you gotta win a couple of rounds. I think Freddie's. I, I think they're still a little vulnerable back there. Yeah. In that. Yep. I I think it's a reasonable criticism until proven otherwise. But yes, they are among the cup contenders out of the East. I would say, and if you know, going through the Metro. It's not, you know, they should be all right. I watched Carolina play, um, I think it was Sunday. They played against the Flames, and the Flames the are high holy hell out of them. They, it was a schooling. The way yeah. you talk about teams that pass the puck, the passing yeah. on that Carolina team, man, they snap well, hey, it around. Sebastian, oh. oh my God, he's a good player. Oh, my God. Munch, he, he could have been a Montreal Canadian if, oh, if, if well, that was such yeah, a bad, I do, I do like him. That was a, lot. a bad offer sheet, a horrible offer like, Thanks, sheet. Thanks, guys. Go ten and a half. Yes. Go no. big. Yeah, but they're like, oh, you just what signed our best right. player to a they reasonable contract. So what did they yeah. offer him? Yeah. Eight, value, eight, two, eight, five. five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like, like, go ten or eleven. Yeah, make it so they can't do it. Huge signing bonuses. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's a really good player. So on the topic of teams, that Finland team in the Four Nations face-off TM. It's going to be scary good, boys, I'm telling you. All right. All right. The uh, team like them, talking with Carolina snapping around. I also watched that Winnipeg Jets. Oh, you game have a bit night. of an epiphany here about the Jets, I believe. I'm a believer. I'm a Jets believer. I That game they played last night, I know it's coming off their worst game of the season, yeah. according to their coach. They gave up, what, 23 shots? Yeah. And I mean, they hit six posts, and Washington yeah. looked ready to cry. Tofoli was zone. in front of the net all night. He was. He put it through Ovi's legs. Like, he, they just. Every line is so solid. Every single yeah, line. Yeah, they, they, look, they look deep. They are so deep but up front, and their goaltending is so good that their D just has to be okay. No matter what, though, they, they will be underdogs, right? Well, you, the West you've got is, Vancouver ahead of them. You've yeah. got Vegas ahead of them. You've got Edmonton ahead of them. But they can win the Central. They I, can play the underdog role and find themselves in a conference final. Well, that's I, it. Let's I say, don't disagree let's say they on win that. The Central and they draw Nashville in round one. They will mop Nashville in four or five, and then they win a series. And all of a sudden, we're talking about the Jets here. Yeah. I, you know, I watched a lot of Edmonton this year. Watched a lot of the Jets. Yeah. Gun to my head, like if I was betting my life on who would make the final. I'm not sure which way I would go. Yeah. Like, I really do think, obviously... You mean you bet on an endorsement of Winnipeg? Yes, you yeah. bet on McDavid. Clearly, he's the best player in yeah. the world, maybe of all time. He's an unbelievable hockey player. But you're doing a Skinner-Hellebuck thing. Like, I, I, love, I love the goaltending. Like you said, I love that third line. I love that Lowry. Like, he's just a huge, steady... Like, and and you know, get just Toffoli. another guy that's Absolutely. like a proven playoff performer. Shifley's gone to another level. Like, I really... You know, there's a there's a sneaky rivalry, not a sneaky rivalry. There's a rivalry between the Leafs fans and every fan base because they all just hate the Leafs, and we kind of have to pretend that we don't like them too, so that they think we care about them. But anyways, uh, the Jets have like a sneaky rivalry with the Leafs and them during the bubble or whatever it was, the Canadian division. Yeah. It was a really good rivalry, and yeah. we know all about that. I'm rooting for them. I, I really would like to see them make I a run. I tell you, you know, come on, you, you get some Canadians. You get. Here. This is where sometimes we can just overload and overrate lineups yeah. that, and I'll go back to even to watching the Leafs and their misery in their f first round knockouts. Mm. Just switch goalies. Yeah. That's it. Really? Don't, don't worry about the defense. Don't worry about the forwards. Just switch goalies and the Leafs beat 
Columbus. They yeah. beat Montreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, just yeah. that. That's it. That's the only so way. they beat Tampa. They beat Tampa. Easily. Yeah. Just switch goalies. Right. Mm-hmm. So now we're going into the playoffs, 16 teams. Yeah. Your Islanders sneak in, yeah. and Sorokin's on fire. Right. Hella Bucks on fire. Joseph Walls on fire for the and Leafs. all of a sudden, you're, you got Aiden Hill, Gorgiev, you know, a bunch of guys that you're like, I know they've had some success, but are and, we sure? And now it seems a little bit more realistic here on upsets. Yeah. That's the way it truly works in the NHL. Yeah, so playoffs. it would be, who's got the most points? It would be Florida versus, well, I guess by points percentage. Well, no, they're dead tied with points percentage and points with the uh, Islanders and Red Wings. So it's like, it's a dead tie right now. Yeah. But, you know, Islanders, Florida, waste eight days or could, the, could they put a couple? I would say the difference is Red Wings, Florida, the Red Wings don't eight have, days. yeah, because they don't have the goalie to make that a thing. Yeah. Like Sorokin can black out. Yeah. You know, it's the only way you're hanging around that series. I picked Dallas to win the Stanley Cup. They sit first in the Central. That division is okay. A slog. Dude, and I'm, Haskin and, and that Thomas Harley and, and Tanner. Yeah, they they got their 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 top three lines are as good as any's. Yeah, and they have, of course improved with Tanov. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now, Dallas is going nowhere unless Jake Ottinger, Ottinger yeah. goes mm -hmm. to another level. They are where they are right now. And he hasn't even come close to the Jake, Jake Ottinger we saw a few seasons ago uh, almost steal You're right, one Kevin. for the ages. I haven't looked at his numbers this year. He's in 41 games. He's at a, two, he's at a 900 save percentage. No, it's 295 buddy, goals against. And, and, and look what they're doing. Yeah. If this guy even comes close to where we think he can get to, then, then I'm a believer of Dallas. But yeah. it's we're down to like goaltending now. I don't love Dallas's forwards like I love some other teams. But that decor is very good. Yeah, yeah. Otten, they need Ottinger going. Yep. But we'll do we'll do game uh, time on the other side of the break. Okay, we'll take a quick break, and Sammy will give us a little game time. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee. And remember, you can always text us at 59590 if you got any thoughts on, on Matt Rempe and his four-game suspension. And sure, we'd love wait, to hear you. Wait, what do you think the temperature's out there? People want him out of the league or I, people I are still going, I, I still kind of like him. Soon as it happened, I tweeted, you know, like, brutal hit, going to get suspended, just my quick thought. And what was the and, response? You know, primarily people being like, I agree, but the Department of Player Safety won't do it because X, Y, Z. But there's a, one in particular was like dumb, dumb take. Like, you know, if you're not allowed to hit people or whatever, it's just like some people you want are. everything this guy does to be okay. Oh, my gosh. He would put the fear of God into half the league coming at them. Yeah. Like, yeah he, once just... he gets control of that body and puts another, he'll put another 15 pounds of muscle oh, on that frame. I mean, you know. And he skates I, like a missile. I hope he I like him a lot, a but I, I think it's a really really bad luck to not fight after that and to be waving to the bench after you're getting to wave well, to the bench the after not fighting Listen, is, like, you know, I, you're gonna have I to love the kid now. and i love it all but this i think is, that's pretty bad i'll be honest with you i'm not sure who it is on the new york rangers but somebody's gotta be there to talk to him like that that, that Truba? yes somebody but the the theatrics the waving Right, he's just young. He's just a twenty-one-year-old. But that that stuff yeah. has to clean up because I'll tell you something that it reminded me right away was Mark Messier with Ty Domi. Ty Domi came into New York City, Madison Square Garden, same hype, up against Probert, then the the heavyweight belt, mm -hmm. right? The speed bagging uh, motions. Oh, yeah. Which cousin? Uh, love it all. What, what am the, I? The, <laughs> hold on. The core the, memories. The, the again. riding down yeah. the ice on his stick. Yeah. And you know what Mark tells him? Don't do that. You're a hockey player first. Yeah. Okay. No sideshow. And Ty shut it right down off of Mark Massier. And Rempe's. Cannot allow the waving of the hand, bye bye. That that stuff is just you no. Know, be a hockey player first. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's, I don't know if they have that guy. I don't know if Truba can do that the way Mark Messier could, but yeah, someone's got to tell him. Um, game time? Game time. It's game time. Presented by Bet365. Visit the app for latest odds and find out why it's never an ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19 plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. Um, so there's a lot of games tonight. 10, I think, in fact. Uh, some really good ones tonight. Mm -hmm. um, looking specifically at the really good ones here. The Florida Panthers paying a visit to Dallas to take on the Stars. Good game. Two Stanley Cup contenders. Uh, the, the Florida Panthers are, you know, minus 105. Dallas Stars are minus 115. So a little bit of value, almost even money on the Florida Panthers. I don't necessarily, you know, that's a tough one for me to handicap. But if you're getting the Florida Panthers at almost even money against almost anyone these days, feels like a pretty good bet. So give me the Cats, you know, <laughs> at uh, minus 105 over the Dallas Stars. And the other one that's really good tonight in uh, Carolina gets the Rangers in the second half of back-to-back, -back, you know, coming off the Rempe thing, maybe a little bit, you know, tired. Uh, the Rangers are plus 150 there. It's a minus 180 for the Carolina Hurricanes. It's a big number, maybe Gensel's debut. So that's why they've kind of juiced it up a little bit. Not bad value, obviously, on the Rangers, but that's a really tough spot for them to come in there and uh, get two, night two wins in a row there for me on that one. I, I think, you know, taking plus odds on the Rangers at any point is pretty good, but that looks like a round two playoff matchup. Not sure who else could come out of the Metro there. Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking at this one here. The Detroit Red Wings need a win in the worst kind of way. Yeah. They are in Buffalo tonight. They are plus 115 against the Buffalo Sabres. I or have bet them. Or my, who have you bet? Detroit. Okay. I think this is a really good spot to get the Red Wings who – have shown to be a pretty good team at times this year, obviously on a cold stretch, but they need this one in Buffalo. I'll be a ton of Red Wing fans there tonight. Give me the Detroit Red Wings plus 115 to take down the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, plus money against Buffalo. Are they going to kick themselves at the end of the year for for letting the Islanders creep in? Steal their playoff spot? You know, I feel like so often we talk about streaks and runs of play without looking at the schedule. Like, Detroit lost five games in a row or whatever. They mm -hmm. lost to Vegas, Colorado. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but they lost to, and they like... Lost to the, and they lost to uh, the Islanders in that stretch. Yeah, that was yeah, a bad they, one. It started their losing streak. But they played three really good teams. Arizona stung at 4 nothing. That one stung. That but, one stung. But I think they, they played three really good teams there, too. Yeah, yeah. And they've got Buffalo now twice. Yeah, yeah. so they, they came up beating the Red Wings 8-3. to three. Beating who? Uh, the Red Wings beat the Capitals 8-3, to three, yeah. and then they lost five in a row, including against the Panthers, against the Avalanche, against Panthers the Golden Knights. Golden Knights. Yeah. So they got Buffalo, Arizona, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Columbus. No oh playoff teams. Got to no make playoff some teams. Yeah. Oh, you got you to gotta race your 0-5 uh, and, and then yeah. right there. Massive matchup against the Islanders March 21st after those games. Like that is a, That's a big one there for them. All right. Uh, that was game time presented by Bet365. Visit the app for latest odds and find out why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19 plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. You mentioned uh, Carolina and Florida. If if we were to look at all 32 teams right now, who who, who has the best defense right now? It's a good question. Um, Vegas? Vegas is top okay. of mind. Yeah. But I, I like what Colorado has now. You do? I do. Quite a bit. I, I, I was. I would say Colorado because they have Kale McCarr and Devin Taves. Like it's just the top McCarr, end of Taves, that. Walker, now. Manson, Gerard, Walker, Jack Jones. Well, I mean, they're going to play thirty minutes every night in the playoffs. They're going to play the whole game. So, to me, it's it's still Colorado. Because I Vegas. I also. Is... I also look at uh, Carolina, and one guy that just. Defying all odds is Brent Burns. I watched him the other day, and 20 minutes. He's almost turning 40. He doesn't miss he games. I, Sammy, 39. Yeah, he's getting up there. Brent Burns. Like, like what a pickup. 39. What a pickup by Shot Carolina. Yeah, top pair playing with Jacob like Slavin. You just, know what's great too is to play with a guy like Slavin. Let's Burns kind of do his like. Yeah. And did dog they, did they retain? Thing. On him? Did the Sharks retain on him? No. no I think no they did. I think they did. The Sharks have two years retained, four years retained, and six years yeah. retained in their three retainer slot. They kept...
Pesci doesn't sound like he's going to resign, but they're going to rent him. Yeah. Slavin. Like, that's a really, really Their bottom good pair is Dmitry Orlov yes. and that Jalen Chatfield, who they really like. And yeah. what's, what's Orlov making? Like Money. Six yeah. million? Yeah. Seven million? Something ridiculous for a third pair guy. Yeah. I can't think of a more perfect guy to play with Brent Burns than Jacob Slavin. I agree. Like, I, Probably the best choice in the league. I've watched so many of their games. I'm like, does this guy make one mistake ever? Like, he is so solid, quiet, just really good. And the other blue line that I don't think gets the credit it deserves for being one of the top ones in the league are the Florida Panthers. Yeah. Like, they're, they're sneaky good back there. They're big and strong. They lost Ekblad maybe for, what, a couple of weeks? Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, two weeks it says but at least. This we mentioned this Forsling who just signed a new contract. Eight year deal, right? Eight year deal. Larson's come out of nowhere. What a pickup that is. Everybody's going, Vancouver included. Yeah. Get rid of him, get rid of him. He stinks, he stinks. He fits in nicely. Montour, like he's gonna make a lot of money. He's UFA. And then this um uh, Mikola. Yeah. Big guy too. Yeah. And you know, Kulikov's no joke either. They're 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 seventy deep. Oh Barra. boy, are they ever? Where do, where does the Leafs rank in this Ooh. category? Yeah, that's that's ultimately uh, the challenge right there, Sammy. Yeah, no, but I, yeah, I think you could make the case that it's the Canadian teams that have a great chance to win a cup this year. None of them have decors that can rival that. The Oilers, a nope. uh, little flawed. The Jets, it's probably their weakness. The Canucks. I mean, the Canucks might have, what do they got? Hughes, Hronik, Cole, Cole Susie, Susie, Zadorov, Juleson. Susie's a You're missing big, someone there. Yeah, uh, Zadorov. Did you say Zadorov? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, but, listen, like, yeah, that's, but it's not. Quinn like Hughes has got to be on, he's got to have a Makar run Yeah. for Vancouver to carry. The problem is you have to win your division, which they probably will, but then you're playing like, if you're finishing second, like, take the Oilers, you're going to have to play Vegas, Vancouver, Colorado, or Vegas, Vancouver, Dallas, or, you know, like, it's a real tough. Quinn Hughes is minus 340 to win the Norris this year. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, he's he's on pace for over 90 points still. Yeah. He's he's humming along. Hey, did you see the this expansion thing, the Anson Carter? Anson Carter, Yeah. Yeah, that's been that's been out there for a little while. That Anson Carter had we a group. Talk about that on air. I don't yeah, think, I think I don't know if we did on air. I think we may have briefly it mentioned is, it. Yeah, it, it it's definitely out there that he's got a group that very much uh, wants back in in Atlanta. Yeah, they want to do a development that'll include an outdoor stadium for soccer, a lacrosse, a hotel, retail, performing arts venue, esports venue, as well as community and practice facilities. So it's one of those things where they're looking to develop a piece of the city yeah. and, you know, include the yeah. Atlanta they're, trash. I'll say this. There, <laughs> there's some be? issues here. There's some some holes that need plugging in the National Hockey League. But Gary Bettman and Bill Daly are not short of people calling them up and saying, I want in. I honestly, I can't hear this without feeling some resentment that it didn't happen when I was a player. Uh, you know, when they I would, I would have loved for there to have been 38 teams in the league. That would have been very beneficial for my career. My point is the hockey is going to get so bad. People like yeah. me are going to get to be involved and that's not good. And I know, I know there are certain owners out there that want Gary jumping the fee. To get Spike in. it up to a. Seven hundred million, eight hundred million. Keep Bill going. Billion dollar entry. Keep going. One two five. Keep going. One point five. Keep going. One trillion dollars. What are you dollars. talking about? Two, two billion dollars. Vegas was five hundred. But Vegas is worth one seven five now. Vegas, what? No Vegas way. is not worth five hundred. <laughs> no, they're not worth a mil a billion. They're 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 north of that. $2 billion. Hey, listen, the, here's my the, question for hey, all these owners. Larry Tannenbaum's getting out with an evaluation of $8 billion for the Leafs, and that is probably that's light. under, it's light. Yeah. Like, that's where these fees are going, and it's billionaires that are driving this thing up.
Do these, uh. <laughs> do these guys... Don't back up the truck in my ear. Do they need more money? They own a pro sports team worth $1.75 billion. They need to I'm, take listen, checks I don't from... know if it's, if, if, if it's realistic or not, but that's where some owners want Gary to go. I'm, and, I assure yeah. you that. And yep. that's why people like Michael Handlauer... You know, yes. do backflips to get a yeah. franchise for a billion dollars because now may, they're in line for the next pay, payout. Yeah, may have bet on the but wrong you, you got to there. You got to sell it though first, right? What's that? <laughs> to, to hit that payoff, to get the you, you got to yeah. sell it, and in the meantime, you need your tens of millions to carry it. Yeah, but I mean, people have been. I feel like franchises are turning over mm. more than they used to. Like, didn't Mario sell his chunk of Pittsburgh? I think Mario is very minimal now and really doesn't have anything to do with uh, the day-to-day -day or anything I, like that he's very much enjoying his life well, as that, he should. to me this is like the logical way to behave it's like i even feel this way about yeah. like zuckerberg and facebook can you not just separate yourself from it take whatever cash you can free yourself from whatever problems and lawsuits and whatever take your paychecks go play golf some guys hate golf <laughs> <laughs> i can't imagine not the three of us no um, we're getting close. Yeah, we are getting close. Uh, anyways, continue. Uh, I Kip, just, we're going to be missing you the next was, couple well, days. I was going to read the the, okay, the statement ahead. from uh, Bill Daly, but what's happening? Which the most, one? He put out a statement about about uh, Atlanta. Yeah, oh, uh, I Greg, hear it. Greg Wyshynski tweeted it out. It's I mean, the league appreciates Anson's passion for bringing the NHL hockey back to the Atlanta area, and he has certainly kept the subject on our radar screen for several years. While we have made clear we have no expansions uh, expansion oriented process place it currently it's always good to know there's bona fide interest See, yeah. so would they have Thrilling. reached out to anson like i saw the collection of people neil liebman of top tier sports uh, peter simon of simon sports and aaron ziegler of ziegler Ent ziegler entertainment group to them i don't know how much anson carter has money wise but i don't presume he's putting 50 million dollars into this i could yes. be wrong so like i was with the ottawa right, senators that's right so it's like you have a <laughs> hockey guy who knows how to you know, who can help sure, them the navigate face. these waters, be the, the face, face of it, yeah. that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Were yeah. they asking you to put in $5 million or what, $50 million? <laughs> No comment. <laughs> right. Buddy, yeah. I'm asking you to buy me lunch yeah. today. <laughs> you, you, you might really? Have, you might have dodged a bullet there, Kippy. Uh, yeah, so any any plans in the near future for you, Kippy? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm taking the rest of the week off. Whoa! I, want, I want you guys to steer the ship. From Kip, here on in. Kip has an upper body injury. Yeah, and, and beat it. And he needs to stretch Addressed. it out by swinging his really hands need, over his shoulders. I really need a break. <laughs> yeah, listen, man. I don't Sammy, you. will your game time be okay without me? I don't know. You have to get somebody in here to do it. I Now that I'm moving over to the big desk, I don't know what the hell yeah, to do. So You're coming over here? I don't know. I mean... I feel like they're going to make yes me. Is the answer. I feel like they're going to make me, but I don't really want to. I like it over what, here. Should we talk to the hole over here? I, mean, I feel like we should just leave that open. <laughs> just <laughs> just yes. I'm, I'm telling you right now, <laughs> I'm demanding it. You're, you're, you got to up your dress game. Oh, my God. Wear a suit tomorrow? Yes. I don't oh know what it God. is, but I, I, this, this chair's special. <laughs> well, Borny's going to be sitting in that chair, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We'll take it up. Yep, no, it'll be good. We had a big night in the NHL. We'll have lots to talk about, a couple of good hockey games, and we'll get Kip back next week. Ten games on tap tonight. You pick your favorite one, and then you come and share them, your thoughts, with JB and our boy Sammy tomorrow on the Real Kipper and Bourne Show. Our thanks to Boost Boudreaux, former NHL head coach. Always fun, eh, with yeah. Gabby? He knows his stuff. All right, boys. Take it away. Rest of the week. I'm Enjoy counting trip, on you. You've I earned will. it. I will. Perfect attendance till right now. If you get a chance, give us a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. The Real Kipper and Born Show. Have a great night, everybody.